I'm Michael D. Anderson. Arrival days, the day you get here, is, you know, that's it. That's the day. So it's not like a perpetual thing how people celebrate it, as far as I'm concerned. You know, so it's like, okay, what are you going to do from that point on? It should just be an acknowledgement, like a, a, a school, you know, what did I learn within that year, that time period of that year. So when I go into the new cycle, I'll be prepared to address things, you know, accordingly. I knew about Sonny in 1961. I had an extraterrestrial experience. And to this date, I have proof markings of that situation. And my father introduced me to Sun Ra's music, the futuristic sound of Sun Ra. And uh, I was in I'm from Sacramento, California. And California was having a lot of extraterrestrial visitors, we'll say. And I was visited as a young child and taken to a different place. That's the beginning of me and my connection to Sun Ra. Never knew I'd ever meet the man, never knew that we would be connected, but it was like I had been prepared at it. the age of two, I think it was. I never tell that story, but Sonny made a comment one day in a rehearsal, and I was like, he knew. I'm like, only he would know what that, that situation was, see? So this is the first and probably the only time I'm telling this story, unless I put it on my, my website or something. You know, it was a, more of an Afrocentric kind of situation happening in the black community in Philly. And Sonny was right there in the heart of it. I lived at the house, yeah. I left home when I was 15 years old. I lived on my own since I was 15. I lived with Marshall at first. Marshall was like, you know, played the music for me and stuff. And, and then we would go to rehearsal every day. Because of my affiliation with radio, Sonny saw um, that it was important to have somebody, as we call discipline, that knew exactly what he was dealing with. And he threw me in the midst of his room, which was, I was scared, excuse the expression, shitless, because nobody ever went into Sonny's room on the second floor at 5626 Mort Street. And I was a newbie, and he locked me in that room. <laughs> with all the tapes, and said, I want you to familiarize yourself with the music. I was like, okay. And I'm like, okay, these folks are from outer space. I said, I better listen. He may zap me, you know, because this was all the shit that was going on that people were telling me. So I'm 16 playing with these folks because I was a drummer anyway. One day when that, when I was in that room, I saw all the stuff was all out of whack. You know, the tapes are out of boxes, reels, tape rolling off all onto the floor. And I said, okay, I got to listen to this music anyway, so why don't I just clean up? And that's what I did, and he was really surprised to see I had put the shit in order, you know. And then I think Pico or somebody came in there looking for something, and it was a wreck. And he jumped in my case, and he said, man, I, you got to keep this. It's not supposed to be like this. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, this is your discipline. You're just supposed to be ahead of the archive. I mean, checking out the archive. You know, like, what do you mean? <laughs> So initially, that was the day I was given the right as archive director, October of whatever year it was, I was 17. And I've been, uh -huh. been doing it ever since. Because I had access to state-of-the-art uh, radio station equipment to help do transfers and preview material, da 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 You see what I mean? Let alone I was in the band, so and then they listened to me on the radio, so he adopted me, basically. That's another story. Sad story, but... He got me out of a lot of trouble. <laughs> he was a very fatherly type person to a lot of people because they didn't have a sense of direction. He kept everybody, to, you know, focused with that. Sometimes we sound raggedy as shit. Sometimes we be on on fucking money on that fucking rhythms and shit, you know. And oh man, it'd be it's incredible. But you had to be there to see it. The records tell one side of the story. You had to see this shit. Well, I, I played with the band from 76, I think I was 16, to 82, because some people started to come in that had some different kind of energy that I didn't particularly care for. 
then at the same time, uh, Danny Davis had just passed. Not Elo, e had passed. He baked himself in the oven. See, these are the stories nobody talks about. Nobody knows what happened to a lot of people. I mean, you used to see Eba. He looked like he was just such a gentle spirit until he sang and played that horn. I was like, that's that dude. <laughs> but he was, he did a 72, 72 day fast. And near the end of it, he was delusional and he decided to get in the oven, turned it on and got in the oven. I'm on a lot of shit they don't give me credit for. I mean, the one that you can tell is Lanquity. That was my birthday. That was the first time I recorded with the band. I mean, in the studios. I and mean, we did other recordings, you know, live performances that were recorded and released. Yeah, everybody does something. I mean, if you drink, it's something. Sonny didn't. Sonny would have Tanqueray. Sonny liked Tanqueray. Nobody ever thought of that. He did drink Tanqueray. But that had nothing to do with the music. It didn't affect the music. We had a communal voice, you see what I mean? When we played at the Horseshoe Tavern, <laughs> John, <laughs> John and Don Gilmore introduced me to Old Forrester. <laughs> I played the shit out of them drums. They had to pull me off. They said I was floating in the air. I was like, what? You know, most, a lot of the folks drank. I don't know about the other shit because I didn't do it. Sonny would have had a fit if he knew anybody was doing any drugs. He, he kept me, you know, hurt. he and June. June was like my mom. I'm out on the road illegally, basically. <laughs> Underage. She was, she didn't say much to a lot of people, but it was, I had a special connection with her. Music is science, man. It's beyond what people give it, you know, credit, especially for jazz. Jazz makes you, you know, where you can sit in a room with everybody of different cultures of the world, and nobody has to speak to any, they can speak all kinds of different languages, not understand one to the next person. But if the music is right, and I saw this when I was at an Art Blakey concert, everybody's nodding, Japanese gentleman looked over me, and the guy from Poland nodded at me, and we would just nodded at each other. It, it was groovy, you know, it was really cool. See, but this is why I think the music scientifically, even according to what some, that's why we got along, because we all we thought alike. I was way ahead of my time, as they would say, but we were on time. And I'm not really down for digital, because I know our, our audience wants to vinyl or, you know, like the CD. But I said, okay, but we still need to deal with both plateaus, you know, those people who want digital, we got that. Da -da 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 -da. Well, before he got sick in 84 or 8, yeah, 84, 86, one of the new members of the band came in and stole the Yamaha and all the other organs. That was the extension of Sonny. That was that energy he needed to stay youthful for his age. You know what I mean? Have you ever seen the band live? There's a point where he just started playing standards. I said, that's the beginning of the end. I knew it. I said, something's wrong. He needs those keyboards and all the other little keyboards he tried to get. They were just like, you know, like having a Casio. So you can, and you can hear he was frustrated with it. Because the Yamaha was the extension of him. He can have sound like a B3, sound like a damn helicopter, all that shit with that keyboard. He had had that keyboard for years. Part of that life force that feeds that starts to die in them. And that's a part of them dying. I've known Bob for years, actually. And I was always, you know, I was into the kind of music he was putting out because I was working for WFMU. It's a radio station that's a free-form radio station where I can play anything I like. And I like 60s psychedelic music. I grew up on it in San Francisco. But yeah, the modern harmonic thing is beautiful. I like the packaging. They, 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 the, 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 the beauty of it is, is the care. And Bob is pristine. With it has a perfect ear. You see what I'm saying? For, where when it's, when it's coming out, it's coming out correct. Some people just put it out and it sounds like shit. Okay. In closing, the Sunrise experience is just getting started. I mean, there's so much to come. Modern harmonic a.k.a. Sunday. <laughs> it's a hip situation, man. It's been, I mean, I've always been into that, what they've been doing. So it was just, I was just glad that they offered to do some work with us. Shit, yeah.